Hi there everyone, it's Joe. Welcome back to my channel, or welcome if you've never been here before. For those of you who have been here before, however, you may have noticed that my hair has been recolored again for the first time in a while. So uh, let me know in the comments what you think of this one, because I'm feeling my trans Kuja fantasy right now. Um, you know, I'm pretty happy with it. Anyways, we are here today to talk about Opus 5 for Final Fantasy Trading Card Game, and it's something that I've been really excited to talk about, and I'm sure a lot of you guys have as well. So we're going to be going over various different cards in the set, and we're going to do this very similarly to how I've done this in the past. But instead of me picking one forward, summon, etc., I'm just going to talk about sort of like four or five cards in for every element in the set that I really, really like and I think is worth holding on to for each of you, so that you guys can look for some of these cards for your collection and then we'll kind of be able to get some deck builds off of that in the future for, for videos, we'll be able to have discussions, anything that I haven't mentioned because there are actually quite a lot of good cards in this set, leave something in the comments below and let me know what you think and then hopefully we can get some discussions out of that too. So if you want to see what some of my favourite picks are for Opus 5, then keep on watching. So the first element that I'm going to talk about is going to be fire. Now, I don't know about the rest of you guys, but I often feel that fire gets a bit of a bad rap when it comes to new releases, because people seem to think that fire just seems to get the short end of the stick. And sometimes I'm inclined to agree. However, I do think that there are some shiny examples of good fire cards in this set and others that make it so that fire is still perfectly competitive with all of the other colours. And the first card that I want to talk about with regards to that is going to be Vermilion Birdless Sea Zuyu. Now, the main reason that I like this card is because it's a boss monster for fire that is not named Emperor Xander, which means that it's not restricted to mono fire. Um, Emperor, you know, Emperor Xander is a really, really strong card, and it always will be for, for, for mono fire, but people who want to experiment with dual, dual colored decks with fire involved, you get something new to play with. And I think Zuyu is really strong in that being a 9k guy that can, you know, pose a threat to both your opponent's forwards and uh, their damage zone is worth looking at. Um, having first strike on attacking is worthwhile. It, being being able to give him haste is a huge deal. So, I mean, your opponent is not going to ideally want to block with him, but there's also opportunities for you to kind of combo with Zuyu here, mostly under Earth. If you play things like Raoban or Atomos or Hecatonkaya, which is the Opus 4 Hecatonkaya, then you can often find that you will get the second attack off of his secondary effect, which, as you can see in the picture here, I'm not going to read every card um, you know, that I'm talking about here straight out to you because there's a lot of cards to go through and we'll be here for hours otherwise. But the secondary effect I think is going to go off quite frequently if you build your deck to, to cater to it. And therefore I think the Zuyu is definitely a card worth looking at. There aren't many forwards in this set for fire that I am mind blown about. However, I do think that this particular card is worth looking into. And then going into a backup that I'm really, really loving in this set actually is uh, Ninja. Now, Ninja doesn't look like much. It's a 2CP uh, backup that blows itself up to accomplish the same effect that Red Mage does. Now, the main reason I really like this card is because it's a 2CP backup that can destroy itself, which is very important in FFTCG because it allows you to pave the way for other stronger backups that has an effect that doesn't burn or have something relating to damage. It makes the game that much faster, which is great for any Fire player where you're trying to kind of swing the momentum as hard and fast as you can and try and get those attacks in so that you're putting pressure on your opponent to have to react to what you're doing and therefore you're setting a precedent. So I think that what I really like about Fire in this set is that it's filling in gaps that Fire didn't previously have access to. Like I said, Vermilion Birdless Sea is like a boss monster that you know they didn't really have access to outside of Emperor Xander. Ninja is a self-destructing backup that can give you an effect that isn't burn related. I think that it's really nice to see Fire being able to explore more different kind of variants than just kind of I play cards that burn and do damage to things. I always like that. Like I think that the strongest Fire decks are decks that don't focus on that and have things like your Belias's, your Sabins, I mean, VV is obviously very, very strong, but that is damage related. But all I'm saying is that it's nice to see Fire not put all of its eggs in one basket. And the next card I want to talk about for Fire is actually something that it does do damage. It does do burn damage, but it does it in such a way that I think it's brilliant. And this is Phoenix. Phoenix is a 7 CP summon, which sounds terrifying. Like, you know, we already have Bahamut 
from Opus 1 that is massive. It's like there's a lot of really, really large summons in this game and you don't obviously have room for all of them. But I think Phoenix is very much worth looking at because again, it opens the scope out for you to run outside of Mono Fire. The original Phoenix was very, very restrictive in that it could only bring back anything that cost two CP or less, and it did a very, very small amount of damage across the board. So while I really enjoyed playing uh, the last Phoenix we had along with Kryl, this Phoenix opens possibilities up much, much more. Dealing 8,000 damage to something is enough to kill most things that are four CP or less, unless there's a power booster in effect. And then being able to bring back anything that's 3 CP or less means that you open up a massive plethora of possibilities for combos. Like you could bring in Vivi, which I've mentioned already, and you can take out two guys at once. If you wanted to play the Wonder Twins deck, you know, Palam and Porum, you know, those are featured in this in this set, though. The Palam in this deck, in this set, I have tried to play with, and it's it's not fantastic as much as I'd like it to be but you have access to the other Porum, Palam and Porum that when they're brought back from the break zone they do something and that's a fun little interaction and more importantly there's just like lots of things that you just have good come into play effects which means you get so much value out of just one 7 CP summon and as I've said I actually made a, a deck building help video not too long ago which I'll leave a link to in the description box but if you check that out I've always said that cards that perform multiple functions in this game are cards that tend to do very very well whether it's building momentum um, in you know the same swing as you playing something and something happening to your opponent at the same time is always good things like VV or El Cid and Phoenix does that and does it in such a way that it's doing that itself and then it's bringing something else in that can do something uh, similar. So you end up doing three or four different things at the same time, all of which are pushing you further towards your win. And I think that that's really, really good. Then the last card that I want to talk about for Fire is a card that I haven't had a lot of time to experiment with just yet. There's a card that I'm very interested to see how it performs and that's Good Doe. Now, I think the reason that I like Godot so much is because it fits into a deck that's already doing very, very well, and that's a fire and ice kind of haste based deck. It not only does it increase the number of things that you can give haste to, it gives damage bonuses to things that you can play with Shelk because anything that costs two or less gets 2k power. And it being an FF13 character is something that can be searched with Mog13. So I wanted to at least kind of quickly highlight Godot purely because I think that it has a lot of kind of synergies with cards that are already existing within a deck archetype that's already doing very well. So perhaps maybe think about what dropping one or two Godots in your Shelk based Fire and Ice decks and see how he performs. Moving over into Ice now, and the first Ice card that I want to talk about is a card that I know has been sought after by many an Ice player, and Ice is a very, has been a favourite card for a lot of people pretty much since the beginning of the game, and that's Orphan. Orphan pretty much only goes into one deck, which is Mono Ice, due to the fact that he kind of wants to have as many Ice characters as you can possibly get in order to fulfil the secondary condition of his main effect. But, that being said, he is a beefcake within that deck. Mono Ice has often been kind of, you know, a tempo-based deck. It often requires you to just get a sort of slow build of a large number of forwards before you finally make that push. Orphan kind of does that by himself. Now, when I initially saw Orphan, I wasn't too keen on it purely for the idea that I think thought he was too expensive for a mechanic that the deck already does very, very well by way of things like Genesis and Lock. So, I mean, um, you know, or Sellers as well, uh, they, you know, they're all cards that have done very, very successfully doing this kind of mechanic. But I think that him being a 13 character means that he's searchable through Mog. Uh, it, yeah, that's, so that's beneficial. And there's, you know, I, I don't think I'd ever run three Orphan, but having two copies of him in a deck means that you have a finisher that allows you to just set the set the pace for what you're going to do for the rest of the game. And mid to late game, I think you can push for the win with this guy by himself. So I definitely think that if you're not playing Orphan, you're probably going to be playing against Orphan. So you definitely want to watch out for him when you see light blue on the other side of the table. Following the trend of a lot of uh, Ice's sets in the past, we've got some really good summons to go with Ice this time around as well. And I actually want to highlight two of them and that's uh, Glacia Labolas, or Doom Train, as I'm gonna call it. And I really like this card in particular for the fact that it's modal and in any game, anyone who's ever played Magic knows that the command spells were always very, very, very strong. And, you know, I think that in this game, it's not gonna be any different. Doom Train in particular, I really like as a counter to Al Cid. Now, this is something that I was brought up to me not too long ago, and I think it's a really interesting play. 
Um, you can dull your own forward in response to Alcid being played and force your card opponent to discard a card at the same time, which renders that particular play, which is extremely popular, a lot, lot harder to make effective. And, you know, Ice was always, you know, Lightning was also always doing quite well against Ice, so to have a counterplay like that is really, really nice. And then, you know, there are none of the abilities on this card are bad. You know, dull a guy, freeze a guy, um, your opponent discards a card and deal a guy, dull guy 7k. There's options for removal there. Um, you know, we had a three drop Shiva in set one that while in the X burst did dull and freeze a guy and this card does exactly the same thing with extra modes on it. So I don't see how this card can be bad. And then secondly, you also have another Matthias, which is very simple. At a one drop, choose a blocking forward and break it. Now, this card just doesn't seem like it's in any way necessary for Ice to have because Ice is already very, very good with its removal. It's always very, very good at stopping your opponent from wanting to do anything to you in terms of your attacking capabilities. So adding this kind of card on top of it just kind of seems a bit over the top. Um, to the point now where there's so many good Ice summons, it's like my favourite thing about Ice is that it just has such a wide variety of things you can do. Um, so, I mean, it's going to be difficult now to tell how many of a summon you already want to run. Like, Shiva from Opus 3 is already a staple in that deck. And then Doom Train's come along and he's doing very well. Zalera is going to be fairly necessary, in my opinion, for mono ice decks at the very least, because of a card I'm going to talk about later. And then you also have Matthias as well. So it's like, wow, there's, there's so many amazing options for ice summons, it's going to be really tough to kind of narrow down which ones you're going to want to play. The last card I want to talk about with Ice is actually a card that I'm less keen on than everybody else, but I wanted to quickly highlight it because I'm sure someone in the comments is going to go, oh, why haven't you talked about this? And this is Buckaboo. Buckaboo is a 2CP monster that says when you, uh, your opponent plays a character, you send your Buckaboo to the break zone and your opponent just casts two cards for doing it. Now, on paper, I think this card sounds insane. However, when you realise the mathematics that go into the process behind it, it actually seems a lot less appealing. If you are paying 2 CP into Buckaboo, chances are you're discarding a card for it. And then because Buckaboo breaks himself, that's another card gone. So you're actually only breaking even with your opponent. And I, I'm interested to see where Buckaboo goes, because I think of the cards that say, there's a lot of monsters in this set that say when your opponent does A, you respond by doing B. I think Buckaboo is one of the stronger ones of that kind of set. You also have things like Black Knight and Grenade, which I'll quickly show up on the screen now, that do very similar things. But I think of those cards, Buckaboo is one worth looking at at the very least, because it it does push your game plan further. If you're planning on playing things like Sid Olstein, then Buckaboo's probably gonna do you very well. But you also have Flan from the last set that was also kind of a very similar kind of card and that card saw some play but not a huge amount. So I think if you're not so keen on Flan, you maybe don't want to get too excited over Buckaboo but if you really like Flan then you might like this as well. Moving into Wind now, now I'm actually really excited about this because my favourite colours in this game or elements are Wind and Earth and both Wind and Earth seem to have gotten a great deal out of this set so I'm really excited to talk about them. And the first card I want to talk about with Wind is Adele. Adele is straight up amazing. They're, she just kind of came into the scene and just said hello it's me. And to have a character that has haste and the potential to be unblockable there's there's no one quite like Adele, in, certainly not in this game, in that you don't have that combination of abilities. Your opponent's on six damage, they don't know you have an Adele, you just drop a down attack with her, and suddenly your opponent's dead. It's like this, this character could just snatch games out of your opponent's hand, and, you know, rumour has it that there's a lot of other FF Tactics Advanced 2 characters that can kind of synergize well with her and it makes quite a nice neat little package that just means that you can get to Adele very consistently and just perform obnoxious thing feats so you just snatch games off of your opponent. Quite honestly, if this character doesn't do very very well in the upcoming meta, I will set fire to the rain. Another thing I like about Opus 5 is that a lot of the colours in this set seem to have gained a 2 CP backup that performs as well as, if not better than, some of the ones that we got in Opus 1 that have been staples up until this day. And a card like that I think is true for Wind is Thief. Thief is um, basically 
Opus 3 Zidane on a stick. And it's a very, very strong ability. Having the capability to look at your opponent's hand and discard anything from it. This one is restricted to a character, whereas Zidane was anything. But honestly, that's fine. In, on a 2 CP backup that can self-destruct in order to kind of push the game forward in your favour, I'm willing to bet that this isn't just going to see play in Wind Ice decks, I think it's going to see play generally. You know, Archer was already one of Wind's strongest cards. To have something that can go toe-to-toe -to -toe with a card like that is impressive. So I think that Thief is something, you know, everyone, it's, it's not a rare card, it's not difficult to get hold of, but everyone should be picking up copies of this card because having that knowledge of your opponent's hand and picking and choosing the worst thing that can happen to you from it, that's powerful. The next thing I want to cover with Wind quickly is actually two cards rather than one, and that's Chocobo and Chocobo Knight. Now, Chocobos have been doing pretty well since last set anyway, thanks to the advent of things like Fat Chocobo, and it's been a very, very slow build for Chocobos. Set 3 gave it Izana, set 4 gave us Fat Chocobo, and a Chocobo that was worth running, or two of them in fact. And then this one gave us Chocobo Knight, which is a second searcher for any Chocobo, and the first Chocobo that's actually on curve with its cost. So this is the first 3 CP 7000 power Chocobo, and that, the ability on this card is completely irrelevant. What you care about when you're playing a Chocobo is how big you can get your Chocobos to be. And having something that powerful, that quickly, it's it, like 7000 for 3 CP doesn't sound like much. But bear in mind that you can play Ark in this deck from Opus 2 to give all your standard units 1000 power. You can play Maria to give them all a further 1000 power. You can play Fat Chocobos effect to give it another 2,000 power. The power of Chocobos in that deck gets very, very scary very, very quickly. And having something like a Chocobo that you're pretty much guaranteed is going to be in most Chocobo decks, if not all, that's going to be worth looking at. And then Chocobo Knight not only is a searcher for the Chocobos, but if it's left alive, which is unlikely, I don't think this is quite as strong a searcher as Izana is, being 3 CP instead of 2. However, if it's left alive, you can start recovering your resources way more quickly because you don't have to pay CP for the Chocobos in your hand. You can just dull your Chocobo Knight and start cheating them into play. So, quite frankly, the Chocobo deck was already doing very well. If you want something budgety and something nice and easy to build, start grabbing those birds. There's a lot of wind cards that I like in this set, so I'm not going to cover all of them, but I could be talking about Ishtola, which I really like, I could talk about Mune, which I know a lot of people really like, but the last card I want to cover is going to be Diabolos, and the reason for that is because when I first saw Diabolos, I didn't actually like it very much, I thought, nah, it's a 5 CP win summon, am I ever going to run this over Valor 4? And I'm like, actually, now that I've had a bit more time to look at it, and a bit more time to analyse where I would put it, yes, yes, in some cases I think I would. Mainly because, like, if you try and analyze this Diablos as if it's Wind's equivalent to Odin, you can actually do some pretty scary things with it, because the combinations all seem to work quite well. If you're playing Wind, the chances are you're playing something that can deal a thousand damage, whether it be Cactar, Dancer, Ishtola, there's loads of things that you could do that way. Um, or Barbariccia, there's, you know, combinations of things, Lightning would pair very well with it. The second ability to kill something, uh, to drop something whose cost is four or less to a thousand power, is relevant. And the fact that he can pay for himself almost entirely if you, in the late game, if you have five backups out, is also important. But the most important thing, I think, is that it has, it's got an option that no other wind removal spell has. It's like most wind removal has the ability to kill something that's five cost or bigger and I think that five cost or bigger cards are actually becoming more relevant in this set so it's something in and of itself but the idea that you could take out something that's five CP or bigger and and kill hit or kill something that's four CP or lower after you've kind of done attacks or baited a blocker or something like that I think that that's something really worth looking at. So do I think the Diablos is going to be in every deck? No. However, if you're playing either Wind, Mono Wind, Wind Lightning, or Wind Fire, then that's something I definitely would imagine would be worth looking at. Going into Earth now, and now everyone, most people know that Earth is my favourite colour, but Earth got so much in this set. Uh, uh, Wall is the first card that I'm going to talk about, and first things first, why? Why is he called Wall and not Warrior of Light? Can someone explain that to me please? I've played a fair amount of Mobius, nobody refers to him as Wall. He is referred to as the Warrior of Light, so I really want to know where that came from, because every other instance that features him, like Record Keeper and stuff like that, refers to him as Wall, with a lowercase l, and it's just very strange. 
However, that being said, this card is damn good, and the entire reason this card is as good as it is is the timing on when its effect goes off at the start of your attack phase. That means that you can get, if you play while in your first main phase, you're going to get those effects the same turn that you play him. So he doesn't need to have haste in the same way as some other cards do in order to get their effects. And those effects are actually very strong. You know, giving something 2000 power is never a bad thing. Giving something brave is never a bad thing if it's already powerful. Um, dealing a, a dull guy 3k is probably not going to be particularly relevant uh, in most cases. I'm sure there are times where it will get used, but they're few and far between. But making it so that your forwards are unaffected by EX bursts, that's pretty good too. And having these modal options and things that you can kind of decide on the fly depending on the situation you're in is very powerful. And on top of that, he's a 4 drop 8k, he's on curve. He has searches in this set in the form of Sarah, which is in his colour, and you also have um, Aria who can grab him, There's, uh, who's also in this set underwater. There's a lot of versatility to be had with Wall, and I think that it, I'd be very surprised if he didn't see a lot of play. So if you manage to pull a legendary Wall, be very happy about it. The next card I want to discuss is actually Ingus, which is a card that's very that kind of has a shared ability across four different colours, where you have all four of the uh, Final Fantasy III Warriors of Light, or the DS remake ones. And the reason I want to talk about Ingus in particular is because of where he fits into the game as a whole. Earth has never really been great at providing 3 CP forwards. You have Deleter from the last set, which was brilliant, that honestly is my go-to Deleter pretty much all the time, and pairs up very, very well with the aforementioned Wall, by the way. Um, you have Rydia if you're playing Mono Earth, if you're, you know, I mean, I, I've tested Rydia a few times, and sometimes I really like it, sometimes I really don't. But I think that having a uh, power booster in that slot is worthwhile, and I actually really like his activated ability where you dull three forwards and or backups in order to give something 2000 power, because I think that that makes your existing characters a much bigger threat than they already are, and it's, the, it's one of those cases where the threat of something is almost more important than actually doing it. And I think that Ingus is just kind of fits, the, it fits any mono earth deck beautifully, and even some decks where if you're doing like a Warrior of Light theme, you could do like an Earth Water build where you feature Refia and things like that as well, and then it will buff each other and it works out quite well. Um, though I, I've yet to explore that archetype, so it might not be that great for all I know. But that being said, I just think that it, the, all four of them are worth highlighting, but I wanted to pick at Ingus in particular because I think that his position in the game is very strong at the moment. So I think that if you pick up some Inguses and Let's face it, the artwork on all of those cards is very nice as well, which is uh, it's, it's always welcome, so pick them up. Okay, again, the same th problem as we have with Wynn. There are so many cards that I could talk about under Earth, it's crazy. You could have, I mean, I'm not going to mention them all right now, but you have Momody, Cecil, Mog, Miner. And there's so many really good cards in this set. The, the, the next one that I want to talk about is going to be Star Sybil. If you want me to make another video where I can kind of talk about some more of the cards in this set so you guys can get even more of an option of an idea of things to talk about, then leave it in the comments below because if you guys want it to happen, then I'll make it happen. But Star Sybil is something I wanted to highlight in particular because my god, this card has some synergies. This card is a searcher, and an EX burst searcher no less, for one of the most popular cards in the game since the day the game was released, which is Shantotto. Now, having a searcher for a board wipe that builds your board while you're doing it is extremely good. And, uh, you know, as someone who adores Earth as a playstyle as much as I do, having one that can search for Prish is also very, very good. You know, Mono Earth Prish decks have been sort of coming out of the woodwork since the last set and the two drop Prish came about, but this makes it so much more consistent. And then the ability to just crack the Star Sybil and just flop out of <laughs> six CP or less forward for nothing means that she's so much more value for the cost you put into her that she's absolutely worth running. You know, being an EX burst, being a searcher, being a cheat card, or a card that can cheat things in, it's just she does so much in such a small package, and that's nothing to stay against the character because she is very little, but she does so much, and I don't see how anyone could dislike this card. It's just very, very strong. And then I know I mentioned that I wasn't gonna talk about it initially, but I do quickly need to mention Miner because again, that card is crazy. Um, it seems like Earth is becoming this toolbox 
color where you can just grab whatever you want from wherever you need it. Um, mine are when it comes in, picks up a backup from your break zone. So turn one, if you get it in your opening hand, you could always pitch a backup as part of the cost to pay for it and then just pick it back up again. And then you can use it to, you can crack it and put it into the break zone to put any forward from your break zone back in your hand. So it kind of pays for itself over time, but more importantly, it's something, it's almost on the lines of devout in the sense that of the amount of value you get out of it from Opus One. And Again, I'll mention Prish, because Miner makes that particular build of Earth 10 times more consistent and 10 times scarier as well, because your opponent goes to kill your Prish, you then, in response, break Miner and then grab a Prish out of your bin so that you've then got one just to put straight back down again afterwards. It's like, and you could have even picked up a, another Miner from the playing the Miner in the first place and you end up with a never-ending supply of Prishes. It's crazy. So I did want to quickly highlight that one as well. Lightning actually got some really nice tools in this in this set and that's in a, in a way that I really like because it means that lightning decks can kind of be a bit more varied and uh, one of the things that I'm going to talk about is uh, Illua and Illua is a really really nice card as a target for Al Cid and I know that most people who play Al Cid will, uh, will sit there and go oh god more Al Cid targets it's like yes but this one is very good and it's good for a different reason it doesn't compound damage in the same way that like Onion Knight or Rigdia do but it's a 3 CP hasty forward that's quite difficult to remove if not looked after properly I mean there's AOE things you can do there's abilities that don't target but strictly speaking Killing Illawa is harder than it is most things because of her ability to cancel the first thing that targets her each turn. So basically you're just going to need to get something that's much bigger than her and because Lightning is very very good at dropping power and dealing damage to things, that's not going to be the easiest thing. So I think that even just having Al Cid damage something and not necessarily kill it straight away and then attack with Illawa and the chance that they're not going to block with it and then even if they don't block with it, you can still finish the guy off. There's, I think Illawa, again, and then going back to Adele as well, and with less puns this time, I promise, um, having the FFTA2 package is quite nice because there's a searcher for both of them in uh, Cid of Clan Gully. If you really wanted to invest in it, you also have Luso under Wind. There's lots of little things you can do to just kind of perk up the FFTA2 package, and Illawa is a really good part of that. I did also want to talk about Twilight Odin because I think that the card's really, really good, but I've already made a video on Twilight Odin and you guys can check that out in the description box below because it was actually the card that I was allowed to spoil for this set and I'm really pleased about it because it's a very, very good card. But one thing I didn't mention when I was doing that video is its synergy with Opus 4 Lightning and it being an FF13 character that benefits from Lightning's effect very, very heavily makes me really want to explore what you can do with that synergy because I think that that's another build of Lightning that, um, the element Lightning, including the character Lightning, that can, you know, really open up possibilities for people. So if you have copies of Opus 4 Lightning, I would suggest picking up some Twilight Odins as well and then seeing what you can go with that, whether it be Mono Lightning, Lightning Earth, Lightning Ice, something that can search for Lightning and give you more access to 13 characters. I think that a 13 kind of styled deck can finally really work. I think it would be remiss of me to not mention both of the legends in this set as they're both very, very strong in very different ways. The first of which is Zemus, which Zemus is one of those cards and there's a couple of cards in the set that are like this, which they don't, or Zemus in particular doesn't have an effect as soon as he comes in. However, if you don't kill Zemus very, very quickly, you will lose the game because of him. Zemus will just accumulate card advantage over time like nobody's business. If you give him haste, then, or if you have the ability to give him haste without having to pay too much into him, then go ahead and do it, because as long as you grab something back that he's already started paying for himself, and the more you do that, the more it's gonna get that way. You know, it's like being able to resurrect your dead Al Sids, resurrect your, um, dead lightnings, things like that, especially like the, the two drop lightning in this set that goes back to your hand after you are, you know, the end of the turn. It's, it's, it's a really cheeky way of kind of reserving resources and like being able to pay for things later. Um, I, there's a lot of things that you can do with Zemus and I think it's going to be a very, very popular card, but it's, and the lightning legends in this set are two that I think are going to be sought after by a lot of people. And then I'm going to quickly go on to the other one, which is Ramza. Ramza goes pretty much exclusively into one deck archetype, which is a deck archetype that has benefited a huge amount from this set, which is Knights. And Lightning Water Knights specifically, although I'm sure there are going to be people who experiment with other 
little variants and stuff. Because the second you get rams at a 10k power, whether that be by swarming the board, or whether that be by having an Ovelia down, or a Treon down, who is another card in this set, um, having access to things like uh, Clayde, who I'll get to in a second, because that's a card I definitely want to talk about in mono in when it comes to water, but it's actually not very difficult to get rams at a 10,000 power. If you listen to the podcast that uh, I co-host with Alex Hancocks, which is the Crystal Tower, again, I shall leave links in the description box below, then we do talk about some of these cards, like where we kind of look over other people's decks and seeing what they like and what sort of things that they're performing. And that's something that I might like to bring onto the channel more as well. Um, a lot of people are really feeling this Ramza. And I liken it to Bart's from Opus 3, where it's it, it's very specific on what it does, but what it does, it does extremely well. Moving into water now, the first thing that I wanted to talk about was Clayde, which is a card I've already mentioned once when we were talking about Ramza. Now, Clayde is a 2CP backup, which is already in its favor, that has an ability that changes one of one of water's worst matchups very, very drastically, and that's Ice. Ice has always kind of like been a bit of a nasty thing for water for a while, but this card allows it, if you're playing Knights, and a lot of water decks do, whether it be Steiner and Beatrix, or some of the new FF11 cards like Curilla, um, you can do a lot with just dull your back up, activate your forwards. It's like you've played a Shiva, no, I don't really care about that. You've played a dull and free, you've played something that freezes something, you just completely get rid of it. It counters Genesis in a really, really pleasant way. It's it's very, very strong in that particular deck. If you're playing Lightning Water or Knights, then you also get way more. You can like attack with your Ramsa that we've just spoken about, break something, deal them damage, and then if they go to attack you, you just uh, you know activate it and it's ready to block. It's it's just a great card. The next card I want to talk about is probably my one of my favourite cards in the set, and this again comes under the whole modal thing, and it's Bismarck. Bismarck does a lot for 2CP. A lot. The main thing you're probably going to use Bismarck for is its third ability, which is halving a forward's power rounded down, and that's a very important thing to know because it's going to cut a 9k guy to 4k instead of 5, and a 7k guy to 3k instead of 4. So that's a very important thing to know because that allows you to then use removal you wouldn't have ordinarily used. Like, having Again, we'll go back to Lightning Water. If you have an Opus 2 Black Mage in your hand and a Bismarck, that's 4 CP to kill something that allows you to build while you're doing it, and that's going to kill something that's 9k. That is not something to sniff at. So I think that Bismarck is really, really great. And then having that kind of Scholar that your opponent can't see is also very relevant, because if they've poured loads of resources into something to try to get, get rid of it, and you go, no, I'll put it back in my hand, even better. Having... it's not quite Monster Hate, it might be for some of the more expensive monsters, like Ozma, but it's it's still kind of available to bounce a monster to its owner's hand. Um, you know, you, you could use uh, you know use it to bounce back a Tombra you control or something like that if you wanted to get more use out of it. I mean, I don't think that's particularly huge, but I think that's probably the least useful ability on the on the on Bismarck. But that being said, it's still going to get used in some capacity. But I think even if you have like 2 CP unit down and make it a 1 CP summon, then you're talking crazy stuff. And, you know, water like ice has had so many good summons over the time, most of them named Leviathan. But, you know, having a combat trick orientated thing, which is what water seems to be moving into more now through things like Beatrix, Kukulain, and now Bismarck, is definitely a card that I think people are going to want to pick up. And whoever, one of the things I am going to quickly mention is whoever got in Mobius's artwork for this game needs a needs to have something nice happen to them. Like I don't want to say like Play Rise or anything because that's irrelevant. But I, that, that whoever did that, thank you because their artwork for Mobius is all has always been really great, and more people should be able to see it. Another card I want to talk about when it comes to water is Porum. Um, Porum and Palum have always been very, very kind of controversial when it comes to the card game. Like, some people really like them, most people think that they're bad. And with this set, we've got a legendary Palum and Porum, which, again, is controversial because people may not be too keen on them. Palum isn't fantastic. Porum is really good. Like, I mean, as somebody who likes consistency in his decks, I adore this card. Like 4 CP for a two for a 5k guy that has an EX burst that gives you a range of choices for things to add to your hand, and then a defensive ability 
that's actually very strong. There's nothing bad about this card, and the fact that she doesn't do have any interaction with her bloody brother is fantastic. It's like, yes, I can play this Porum in not fire water. <laughs> I'm so happy about this. But I honestly think that this Porum is just a great card. I mean, the fact that if you even if you are playing fire and water, having access to Lenora from Opus 3 that can search for either Palom or Porum is a great thing because then you have the EX burst counts go through the roof in ways that actually benefit you. You know, bear in mind that water's always been kind of the EX burst king, like where you have so many consistency changes, where you have like, I mean, even going back to Moogle and Fairy, there's always been so much draw and Porum just adds to that in a way that allows you to push the game further as well because she's a forward and for no other reason than that. So again, if you are lucky enough to pull some Porums, be happy about it. And the last card I wanted to talk about with Water is another 2 CP backup, which Water does have quite a few nice ones at this point, and that's Green Mage. Green Mage does something that I think is should be relevant to anyone who's ever played card games because it's something that cancels an effect. And Green Mage can cancel any action ability or activated ability for those who know magic better than Final Fantasy. Um, it's, it's just really good, like it's useful to have, it's self-destructing, Chances are your opponent is going to be using a lot of activated abilities, but I think the main reason I wanted to highlight this card is because I think that the meta will now shift into more triggered abilities, things like Wall, things like Al Cid, that are like, I mean, they've, they've always been relevant, but I think they're going to be more relevant now because of things like Porum and now Green Mage as well, where activated abilities are going to be a lot lot harder to get off properly. Ishtola is another good example of a card that cancels them. So if your deck is absolutely chock-a-block full of activated abilities, maybe look at toning them down slightly because there are a lot of cards that can cancel them in this set. Going into the light and dark cards in this set, and then one of these cards, honest to god, is probably my favourite card released for a while. Um, the first one of them, however, is not it, and this is Varn. Varn is... 5 CP for an 8k guy, which is not a great start, and has abilities only when he attacks. Now, if anyone's watched my deck building video, which as I said earlier, there will be a link in the description box, I'm not a big fan of forwards that don't do anything until they attack, because there is way too much of an opportunity for your opponent to get rid of them before you actually get anything out of them. Varn's abilities when he does attack are very strong. Draw a card is never bad. Dollar forward is never bad. Making a forward unable to block is also pretty good. You know, it's less good than dulling a guy outright, but having being able to pick both of those is also a thing. It, it, the abilities you get are really nice, but when you're playing light and dark cards and your slots are so premium, are you, are you really going to run Varn over something like Zidane or Terra or Emperor or something like that? If, if it were me, probably not. If you, I think the only way you can make Varn really good is if you give him haste. And therefore, you know, maybe you're venturing into... I mean, Lightning at least gives you the searcher for him in Gramis, because it's an FF12 character, which means you can give him haste through things like Red Mage. Or maybe you could do a Fire Wind deck where you've got access to Goblin, Belias, things like, or Sage, things like that. Um, and therefore, you can help pay for himself, but... There's so many ways to counteract it that Varn honestly doesn't impress me, but a lot of people I seem to I seem to believe really like him, and that's fine. You know, not everything I say on here is gospel, and I've said that from day one. But I that's my reason for not maybe being as keen on Varn as some of you guys. And then the other light card in this set is Wall again, and I really, really want to like this Wall because in a vacuum, he's great. He comes in, grabs something of his archetype, pays for himself a little bit. He dies, grabs something from your break zone, pulls it into play of his archetype. That's great. However, I think that Wall is going to be a card that people look at in the future and not so much now. The reason for that is because the Warriors of Light are all spread across all different colours. So, Warrior of Light himself. Uh, from FF1, has a light variant, which you obviously can't play at the same time as this one, has a fire variant and a water variant. And then you have the three warriors of light from um, FF3, which are fire, water, wind, earth. And then you have the other wall, which you obviously can't have at the same time as this one because it's wall, who's earth. So I like the card in and of itself, but it seems like his synergies are a little bit all over the place. So. Can I recommend Wall? Not right now would be my answer for that one, but it's definitely something to look out for in the future. And the picture's really pretty. 
The next card on this list for Dark is Eldnarsh, and Eldnarsh is a weird, weird card. It's a 6 CP unit that's 10k and has an S ability, which in a Dark card that only has one copy of it, I'm always a bit... I'm wary. If he ever dies or goes to break zone, he goes back to your hand instead. That's always nice, but again, it would be nicer if he weren't Dark, because then you could at least use him to pay for something else. But I think what people want him for is that S ability, which is you take an extra turn, but if you don't do win the next turn, you lose the game. This is the riskiest and most ridiculously fun thing I've seen in a while, and don't worry, this is not the card that I'm talking about as my favourite, but I think it's an interesting play for a lot of people who are looking for something really combo-tastic, really crazy. You know, if they want to try something out, then Eldnarsh is something worth looking at, but it's not my favourite card in the set. I think it's kind of gimmicky and weird, and it's not consistent. But try it. Again, if you guys like it, leave a comment and let me know what you guys think of it instead. But we're going to move on to uh, Camelanort. Camelanort, to me, is a silly, silly card. I adore this thing. It's a 5 CP, 9k guy that's a searcher for something quite open-ended. It can search for anything dark. The first target of which is all, for me, is always going to be Chaos if I haven't already played it. Because it, to me, having anything that can search backups and push your mid or late game that much harder is going to be a good, is going to be a plus for me. But not only is that the case, where he's, this, there's other things that he can search for as well, like Emperor, Zodiac, Sephiroth even, if you're playing like Shadow or something like that. I mean, I'm not going to search for Sephiroth, but it's out there. Um, you have so many options with this thing, and it's one of those cards that's only going to get better as things get released further as, as the game goes on. You could, you know, whatever dark cards are in the game in the future, you're going to go, hmm, well, I can search for that with Camelanort. Not only that, but Camelanort has a defensive ability that's absolutely mad. Remember how I said how if there's certain cards in the game that if you don't deal with them immediately, you will lose the game because of them, like Zemus? This is one of those cards. If you're playing a mono-coloured deck, like light mono lightning or mono ice specifically, you have to have an out to Camelanort in your deck, otherwise you will lose to it. If, if you're playing, I'll quickly go over the ones that I found. If you're playing lightning, then Exodus is a good shout because if you're not playing any five drops, you're not going to lose anything for it. Um, if you're playing ice, then you have access to things like Zalera, but that would require him to attack you first or him to be dull in order for you to actually kill him. Otherwise, this guy's just going to cre create this massive block for you. You have to deal with him as soon as he comes out or he is going to cause you problems. Earth gives you things like Shantotto as well, which is always nice. There are abilities that can get rid of Camelanort that don't target him, but the fact that Camelanort can search for himself as part of his ability means that even if you do kill him, you might just have to deal with another one. And honestly, having tried Camelanor, because I haven't, in all honesty, I, I haven't been able to play you know, as much of Opus 5 as I would like, but I have had, had time to test quite a few things, this is probably my favourite card in the set. It can go in practically anything. It's an FF11 character, so it can be searched for by Star Sybil, which is already a really good card. It's just a fantastic example of what a dark card should be. And, you know, anything that can search for Emperor is going to be good too. But honestly, I'm surprised that El Nash is the legend and Camelanort is the hero. Because he's, that may, means that Camelanort is going to be really easy for people to get hold of as well. And I think that's great. I think everyone, should, anyone who's buying Opus 5, for the love of God, keep your eye out for this card. Because in my opinion, it's one of the best cards, if not the best card in the set. And that's it for the Opus 5 set review. It's not really so much a review as, uh, you know, some recommendations on cards that everyone should be looking for, but I have to give the video a title of some description. For those of you who are excited about some of my starter deck ideas that you can share with new players for the game or anything like that, then stay tuned because I will be making videos to outline how you can kind of improve the Final Fantasy 12, 13 and 14 starter decks. Um, then you can stay tuned for those as well and there'll be loads of other videos coming up soon so thank you very much for watching i hope you've enjoyed it i hope that some of my insights are giving you something a little new to look for in the future and i hope you guys enjoy opus 5 and the rest of the final fantasy trading card game so thanks again and i'll speak to you guys soon see you later